Um, I, I, I'm reminded of the great uh, uh, ceremony there was is uh, my parents had moved from one home to another and my brother and I were highly motivated to make this uh, as swift a move as possible. And, uh, you know, as you're in between two houses, I don't know if you've been there, you've got all the, the, the logistical uh, barriers that there are with being in two places at once and nothing really ever truly belonging and feeling lost and really being divorced from a place that truly feels like home. You have given up on your previous home and yet you're not quite settled in to the new one either. And you feel like you're left in a little bit of limbo in that transition. It gets a little bit uncomfortable. It becomes one of those motivating factors for us to maybe shovel and rifle the boxes just a touch bit faster, maybe faster than we ought to, to get the job done. Well, the people of Israel had been in limbo for quite some time as they awaited the commemoration and the dedication of the new temple. And the long-promised temple. And, and, and remember that David, Solomon's father, was, was, had the, the prestige, the power, the wealth to execute the building project. And we remember that story, don't we? David said, well, this is something that I can take on. And God says, this is going to be for your son, Solomon. The dedication takes place. And God speaks then. And as he speaks to Solomon, he speaks then about what his relationship will be with his people relevant to this new home as they open it. Second Chronicles uh, chapter 7. We're going to begin at verse 11. We read again in Jesus' name. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house all that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. And as for you, if you will walk before me as David your father walked, doing according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish, you, I will establish your royal throne as I covenanted with David, your father, saying, You shall not lack a man to rule Israel. But if you turn aside and forsake my statutes and my commandments that I have set before you and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck you up from my land that I have given you. And this house that I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight and will make it a proverb and a byword among peoples. And at this house, which was exalted, everyone passing by will be astonished and say, Why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? Then they will say, Because they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore, he has brought all this disaster on them. Heavenly Father, these are your words. And Lord, as we gather this Independence Day, I pray that you would um, open our hearts and open our ears. This text may be somewhat familiar to us, but Lord, I, I pray that we would come uh, pretending we're hearing it for the first time. And Lord, that the words that we would hear would indeed be your words, for it is your word alone that is everlasting truth from cover to cover. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
You know, it's remarkable. It, it starts off that Solomon finished the house of the Lord in the king's house. All that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he successfully accomplished. You know, that's probably one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible because, I mean, Wow, right? I mean, this is pretty rare in the Bible that someone sets out not just to accomplish all the tasks that he sets out for himself, but all the tasks that the Lord has set out before him as well. And it's, it's interesting because we have this culmination then of the entire magnificent and famous career of Solomon, the great king of Israel, as we arrive at the dedication of the temple. To make it clear, it's like the cherry on the top of the Sunday. The, the kids were, were out at uh, the lake the other day, and uh, you know they had their little their little smoothie slushies, right? And uh, and they had you know everything that was in there. But you know what the most important thing was was the whipped cream with the cherry on top. Now they never eat the cherry, but it's the fact that they can see it and that it's there, and it 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 it, it completes it completes that dessert. The temple completed Solomon's career, but it was far more profound than that. And I have to wonder, you know, as, as, as determined as Solomon was to see this project through, how well he anticipated what it was that God had to say to them. It said in verse 12, The Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Did you, so, so did you see how Solomon chose this as the place for God? No. <laughs> and God chose this as his place. Do you notice that? Do you suppose it's possible that God said, yeah, you know, I was looking for a one-floor rambler. <laughs> it wasn't until the whole thing was completed and finished that God said, yes, we're moving in, kids. And this will be the place that he makes his dwelling place. Solomon doesn't challenge him. Solomon doesn't rise up in prideful indignation and say, I picked this spot, or at least I made it work to build on this location. You better move in. I put a lot of work into this place. <laughs> no, it is God who chooses to move in. And it will be a house of sacrifice goes on in verse 13, When I shut up the heavens so there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So the end of verse 12 defines the temple as a place of sacrifice. And then verses 13 through 14 define, how, define what a place of sacrifice is and how it's going to function and why it's important to the people of Israel in that place. And what are the reasons that it's important? Well, because when the rain shuts up and there's drought, when there's pestilence, when there is affliction, then there's a place to go to God and say, God, we know you did this randomly. Why was it that God anticipated that there would be famine and pestilence? Was it because he was the, holding a magnifying glass waiting for the ants to crawl out from under the leaf? Or did God know his kids well? <laughs> and as much as you tell the kids, no scuffing up the walls. <laughs> we just moved in. No dragging things on the hardwood floors. You know the kids are going to break their promise. But God provides a means for them, a place of sacrifice, so that as they come to God in such times, in, 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 in times of difficulty, that the Israelites would then bring upon themselves for disobedience, there would be a place to meet God, a place to come into God's home, a place where the divine God of all time and ages and space and time and power would dwell in an in a finite tabernacle so that the people could come and worship and sacrifice in order, to, uh, uh, in order to take hold of the covenant promise of God because they are the people who are called by his name. 
This isn't news to the people of Israel. We read in Exodus how it was that, that uh, as, as God w- was speaking to Moses, that this was the calling of the people as they left Egypt. It wasn't, okay, you're leaving Egypt. Do whatever you want to. You know, if you want to do cul-de-sacs, you want to do ta- townhomes, you want to do solar panels, do whatever you want to do. No, they were called out of Egypt to a calling, which was to be the called people of God and to be a nation and a nation of priests. And what is it that priests do? What is it that pastors do? Minister. That is, to make available and to facilitate God's grace and and God's truth, even as it convicts, but to bring place to people to a place of contrition and repentance. And in this temple system, then, for that, that consequence to then be taken away from their life. If my people who are called by name humble them, who are, are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Is beholding the face of God a small thing? What does it mean to behold the face of God? Well, there's two things certainly that come to mind. One is, of course, Moses, who at the sight of God just walking by him was flashed white, went albino. The other is the the sense in which the face is the fullness of uh, uh, the, 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 the personality of a person. In other words, God present fully to seek the fullness of God, not the little bit of God that we need to get us out of a trouble spot, not, well, you know, we've had some terrorists crash into some skyscrapers. I guess maybe I better try that prayer thing again. But no, to seek the whole God with his whole plan for his whole purpose. There's any hope of having a whole people. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. That is an awesome statement too, isn't it? That in this temple, God is looking. It's it's as if, you know know which one's the trouble one in my family. When Alex is out, (laughs) I'm up in one of the windows watching like a hawk. You know, I, I mean, you take your eyes off of him and you don't count for him within 30 seconds, something's up, something's up. And, and, and with Abigail, you're, you're listening very attentively to keep ahead of some of the drama that picks up. God is not distant and it's not like when you come into uh, the hotel lobby and you gotta ding the bell or you're pushing the electric buzzer and you're not sure if it's dinging anything or anyone anywhere. God is sitting right there, not disinterested, but intently focused on you and his people as they come into that place, his temple, that meeting place with God. I now have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. Now, I'm not aware of another place in Scripture where God says that he is going to put his heart someplace apart from through the power of Christ, him putting a new heart in us. The very heart of God in this temple. And as for you, if you will walk before me as David your father walked, doing according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and rules, then things will go well. And if you don't, then things will go poorly and you will become a byword in the land so that people make you a joke of what not to do. Whatever you do, don't mess up like they did because look what happened. (laughs) I was telling you about Portland a couple weeks ago, walking through and the devastation. It it, it seemed like there was one open business per square block. And and I I was reading articles about Portland 10 years ago and how this was just attracting all kinds of young entrepreneurs coming for the promise of open opportunity. And now everything was boarded up. And here we are walking by, walking through the city, thinking, what happened to you? So too, 
would the people of the world walk by the people of God, walk by the, the, the very temple of God and say, what happened? That so great a place could be destroyed. And they will say, they walked away from the Lord. There are words of great gospel comfort. God enunciates that he will be present with his people. But there are also words of warning that for those that don't take the presence of God seriously, that, that walk away from God and say, well, I just won't go to the temple. Then I don't have to deal with God. Then I can just live my life however I want to. Just because God was in a finite space in that temple, promised to be perched, perched there, does that mean that God wasn't omnipresent and with his people in, in future circumstances through the, the time of Israel? No, as, as, as God was speaking to Solomon, he was there and he was in the temple as people came to meet and intercede for their sins and to seek forgiveness with repentant hearts. David walked well. And Solomon's challenge was to walk as his father. But in verse 19, if you turn aside and forsake my statutes and my commandments that I have set before you and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck you up from my land that I have given you. And this house that I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight and it will make a proverb and a byword among the peoples. You know, it wasn't so many centuries later that indeed the temple was destroyed as the people forgot these words. And as the famine and the pestilence and the destruction and the decay came, instead of seeking the face of God, <laughs> they sought excuses for themselves or they sought their own means of security. God followed through on his word and the temple was taken away. And yet God's promise is that he would be attentive. His eyes would be looking. His ears would be open. He, 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 his heart would be present in the temple forever. So what gives? I mean, the second temple isn't even around anymore, right? <laughs> what does this have to do with us? We had read this text earlier, 1 Corinthians 3.16. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. The profoundness of of the achievement of the Solomonic Temple and the promises that God makes that he will meet and, and restrict himself to, to what was a grand, the grandest palace. But nonetheless, for God to restrict himself to this space to seek his people, what an incredible thing. How many of them anticipated the prophecies that God would condescend even further, sending his son in humiliation to take on the form of flesh to suffer and serve and die so that sin and death could be defeated and the Spirit of God could be given as a gift to his church, his people, to be built as a temple of living stones built on the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. You see, the promise that is made in Second Chronicles is a promise that is directed to those people that, are, that are, are gathered around that temple in that time. But it was established as a heritage to God's people. And as Christ came, he came to his own. He came as Yeshua Messiah as one who would fulfill the promise. And as they awaited what they hoped would be a restoration of a Solomonic temple, Jesus proclaimed in three days, that it, the, the temple will be destroyed in three days, I will raise it. And so Christ was crucified and died and buried. On the third day, he rose again 
from the dead. And after bearing witness to his disciples, ascended to heaven, where he is seated on the throne of God, ruling and reigning today, ruling and reigning the holy nation, his church. You know, it's an interesting thing then as we come together on Independence Day, isn't it? And this text is certainly used very often this morning. And, and you, I mean, you, you hear the, the taken out of context, this, this verse is, all the time. We today care for the salvation of a nation. And yet the only nation that could achieve salvation was Israel. And now today, the only nation which will receive salvation is the nation of God's people. We need to pray fervently for where it is that God is wor at work in the United States and with all that's going on and all, and all that's happening in the background, the spiritual warfare, we don't even see that God knows. And yet, for however attentive we are today to pray for our land, recognize that the holy nation faces much more difficult external circumstances than here. I was convicted about this this week, thinking about, well, I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray for the United States this week, obviously, but what other countries, and this sounds bad, right? But what other countries need it more? I mean, do you suppose that Christians in Hong Kong are worse off than we are? I should say so. North Korea? Ho oh, ho, you haven't been reading the news lately, have you? And so as we pray for our nation today, and we pray for a geographic territory, we recognize that the only territory that God cares about is the territory of his invisible sheepfold, the territory of those that are counted as his until the day of Revelation, Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 12. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. That is the holy nation. And as we pray for our nation today, as much as we'd earnestly pray for things to turn around, <laughs> we pray as a people <laughs> who know what the turn of events will be in that glorious day as we are united brother and sister in Christ in the presence of God as his living temple, worshiping as every tribe and nation and tongue. And this Independence Day, I dare say we can take great freedom in praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ we've never met, in parts of the world we've never been, so that we can appreciate the good things God has given us today, here where we live this Independence Day.